Hey everyone, welcome to the program. I'm Andrew Knox in for Gordon today. It's never happened before in American history. A sitting president facing his predecessor on the debate stage in the race for the White House. President Biden and former President Trump square off tonight in Atlanta. High expectations and new debate rules increase the pressure. CBN's Brody Carter reports. For the first time in U.S. history, a sitting president and a former president will go head-to-head -head in a presidential debate. It's also the earliest debate in modern history, well ahead of the traditional fall schedule. No, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you that is if absolutely you know what, you're, wait, not stop. You're true. Tape, you're doing it. You're going to have tape. true, gentlemen. There's also a new set of rules to avoid chaotic scenes from the past. CBN's George Thomas explains from Atlanta. The debate happening here at CNN in downtown Atlanta will look and sound very different from previous debates. The primetime studio event will have no live audience, no opening statements, and the most unique rule, each candidate's microphone will be turned off unless he is directed to speak. Performance on the debate stage might be the most important aspect for the 81-year-old Biden as Republicans highlight his age and mental health. Which Joe Biden's going to show up? And I, look, my summary is this. It doesn't matter if he drinks a whole gallon of energy drinks. He's not going to be able to match the acumen uh, and the readiness of Donald Trump. While Biden will point to Trump's 34 felony convictions, a first for a presidential candidate and other pending criminal cases. There actually might be more risk for Trump heading into this debate than there is for Biden because of the expectations. Political analyst Nathan Gonzalez tells CBN News because Republicans have made the president out to be too old and incompetent, he sees the real challenge residing with Donald Trump. Trump is used to feeding off of a crowd and feeding, feeding off the energy in the room, and that's just not going to be there. Uh, Trump is going to have to be a little more disciplined uh, when it comes to time and whether his microphone is turned on or off and, and try to uh, try to avoid being be looked at as a bully. As to the issues, Biden is expected to hammer the abortion issue after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade thanks to three Trump appointees. Trump, no doubt, will highlight the flood of unchecked migrants on the U.S. southern border and high inflation. President Biden has been preparing for this debate at Camp David over the past several days. Former President Trump has been on the campaign trail, and last night he attended a prayer conference call with members of a faith advisory board. Brody Carter, CBN News. As Brody alluded to, I have found this fascinating that a sitting president with decades of experience in debates and high-pressure elections and decades in government has spent multiple days with at least a dozen counselors, coaches, yeah. to get ready. It's a really interesting sign. And, and if Trump can have him pivot off script, will President Biden be able, with clarity, to respond well? It'll be interesting also to see how these rules and regulations and new boundaries impact how this all comes off and whether everybody's able to mm -hmm. march to the tune of the new drummer or not. It's almost unimaginable to contemplate what this is going to look like. Well, and, and Trump can't feed off the energy in the room, mm -hmm. and he's not going to get a lot of energy off President Biden either, so how will his perform? You know, he's been campaigning. Yeah. He'll come in high energy, but... I was going to say, he kind of carries his own energy wherever sure. he goes. So for it'll sure. be very interesting to see. And the pr I can't imagine the pressure that Biden must be Yeah, well, feeling. no pre-written I mean, notes. They cannot have yeah, notes pre-written. So that's, it's going to yeah. be very interesting. And David Brody will be with us tomorrow for a full analysis. We always appreciate David joining us. That's tomorrow. Well, in other news, the Supreme Court may temporarily allow emergency abortions in Idaho when a woman's health is at risk. Ephraim Graham has that story and more from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim. Andrew, that ruling appeared briefly online yesterday before being taken down. A court spokesperson said it was posted by mistake and the opinion will be issued soon. Bloomberg News reports the decision shows a majority of the court agreed to dismiss the case involving Idaho's near total abortion ban. Two years ago, Politico obtained a draft of the Dobbs ruling that overturned Roe versus Wade before it was officially released. Despite an investigation, the court never found out who leaked it. Israel's defense minister is wrapping up several days of meetings with officials in Washington. The prime minister is set to visit next month. And now there are reports Benjamin Netanyahu's speech to Congress might contain a surprise. Paul Strand has more now from our Jerusalem bureau. In Washington, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant reportedly is making progress with U.S. officials to speed up shipments of weapons from the U.S. to Israel. 
Benjamin Netanyahu accused the Biden administration of deliberately slow walking such shipments, and the U.S. is admitting there have been bottlenecks in the process. However, the administration is emphasizing its support of the Jewish state. One official told the Washington Post the U.S. has provided $6.5 billion in security assistance since October 7th, $3 billion in May alone. Gallant says Israel needs the U.S. by its side. The powerful and enduring bond between the United States and Israel is key to our nation's strategy and our security. In a visit with Netanyahu in Jerusalem, Democrat Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania pledged his support for the Jewish nation. We stand with Israel, with Israel through this, and uh, I'm so sorry for what's been done to this nation. Fetterman has been a strong advocate of Israel, while others in his party have wavered. In fact, many Democrats signaling they might boycott Netanyahu's speech to Congress next month. Israeli media reports that Netanyahu will present a new position on Palestinian statehood in his speech, but the details are unclear. Netanyahu has long been against the idea, and his office released a statement that he opposes a Palestinian state and will not change his position. Palestinians themselves don't favor a state alongside Israel. Itamar Marcus of Palestinian Media Watch points out the vast majority of Palestinians hail the murderous attack of October 7th. There's tremendous support within the West Bank for what happened on October 7th. Uh, there was a poll taken a month and a half after October 7th, at which time and it, everybody knew what happened. Everybody knew about the rape and the destruction and the massacres. Palestinians were asked, is everything that's happened up till now, does it make you proud as a Palestinian? And 98 percent of Palestinians said it made them proud. On another front, Netanyahu and Israel's president toured the northern border with Lebanon this week. That's where all-out war may soon come as the IDF seeks to end daily attacks from Hezbollah on Israeli communities along the border. Turkey's president says his nation will stand with Hezbollah if it comes to war, and he's condemning Western nations for backing Israel. Paul Strand, CBN News, Jerusalem. Attacks against Jews and Muslims have risen dramatically in the U.S. and around the world. The numbers tell the story in a new government report detailing the status of religious freedom in nearly 200 countries. The State Department officially calls out Hungary for the use of anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim tropes by government leaders. Pakistan is another country of concern. Their Christians face imprisonment for blasphemy against Islam. The report also raises alarm over India, where there has been an increase in the number of attacks against religious minorities. The Family Research Council's Tony Perkins is the former chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He told CBN's Faith Nation the Biden administration is not doing enough to stop persecution against people of faith. When America does not lead, the world follows, all right? We're not prioritizing religious freedom. And if you look at our foreign policy under this administration, religious freedom is at the bottom of the list of priorities. And so when America goes silent on the priority of religious freedom, the voices of those being persecuted are not heard. They're lost. North Korea is one of the worst persecutors of Christians in the world. Thousands of people from all walks of life flee the hermit kingdom every year, including one former military official who told CBN's Asia correspondent Lucille Toulousen about her harrowing experience and the miracles that saved her. During the great North Korea starvation in 1998, Mrs. Son served in the military as caretaker of supplies and later as broadcaster of the Chu Che, North Korea's propaganda outlet. My father was the provincial governor and bribed the military officer with a pig so I could get in the military because it was a way we can get food rations and not starve like the rest of the country. But things got bad when my father lost the elections. He became very sick and died. My brother was detained and died of starvation in prison. In order to survive, Mrs. Son and her mother escaped to China. We swam across the Tuman River for two days and bribed the North Korean soldiers and brokers in China. There, we found a Christian church who helped us. After a few months, Chinese police began to trail them. I was already a Christian, but not deep. But I knew it was God who protected me and instructed me to hide and hold onto the underbars of a truck. I got away, but my mom was taken back to North Korea. I went back to rescue her, 
only to find out that she suffered and died in prison because she did not deny her Christian faith. Mrs. Son returned to China where she married a Chinese Christian. Over time, authorities arrested her two more times, eventually putting her in a North Korean prison under inhumane conditions where once again Mrs. Son experienced God's help. I had to eat insects to survive. After 400 days, I was released, malnourished, and can barely walk. This was when my husband used his Chinese citizenship to get me to South Korea. Here, Mrs. Son joined the Sopyong Church, where she grew in her Christian faith. This is Sopyong Church. Sopyong means Seoul and Pyongyang. Many of its members are North Koreans whom they helped settle in South Korea. They envision a unified North and South Korea by spreading the gospel in North Korea. It is impossible to reunite politically because of different cultures and backgrounds. Therefore, reunification can only happen through faith. During the starvation, many North Korean defectors escaped to China. Many believed Jesus received Christian education in other countries and became missionaries in North Korea, where there are now about 600,000 Christians in underground churches. Many Christians in South Korea who are praying for reunification believe it will happen in five years. North Korean Christians like Mrs. Son can help make this happen. I want to thank my mom and be like her. I am also dedicating my life to serve Jesus Christ and spread the gospel and worship him until I die. Lucille Telusen, CBN News, Seoul. Passionate people of faith. Terry. Wow. Yeah, the passion and the faith that you see come out of people who've escaped from there, amazing. And the pictures and the stories of what happens in North Korea demand our prayers.